What if the next great power source isn't buried in oil fields or locked behind solar panels, but hiding in a simple coil of wire? For centuries, people have chased the dream of endless energy, and some even claim governments fear it. Tonight, we're not selling fantasies, we're following a real trail. Michael Faraday's 1831 discovery that motion and magnetism can make electricity appear on demand. It built the modern world, and it also left a puzzle that still stirs debate. By the end, you'll know what's truly mysterious, what's misunderstood, and why the legend of free energy keeps returning. The dream and the suspicion. The dream of free energy is older than steam engines. It shows up in myths, in late night talk shows, and in comment threads that swear a breakthrough is always about to be erased. The pattern is simple. If a machine could run forever, someone powerful must be blocking it. That story feels neat because it gives the mess of history a single villain. But Faraday's story starts with the opposite. It starts with a quiet lab, simple tools, and a man who refused to ignore small effects. Before we go further, we need a hard line. A device that makes energy from nothing is perpetual motion, and it collides with the basic rules of nature. Governments don't need to ban it, reality does. What governments and utilities do to police unsafe devices and false claims? A generator wired incorrectly can shock people, start fires, or blow equipment. A scam can drain savings, and a homemade system that pumps unstable power into a grid can trigger expensive damage. Regulation is often boring, but it is usually about safety and fraud, not secret suppression. So the real question isn't who stopped it. The real question is, what counts as a source? Electricity is not fuel. It is a way energy moves. If a coil lights a bulb, something else is paying the bill. Your hand moving a magnet, a turbine spinning, steam pushing, water falling, or sunlight stored in motion. Faraday didn't find unlimited energy. He found a bridge that turns motion into current, and that bridge changed everything. Faraday before fame. Michael Faraday did not begin life as the kind of person Victorian society expected to transform science. He had little formal schooling, worked as a bookbinder's apprentice, and taught himself by reading the books he bound. Instead of advanced math training, he built a different kind of power, careful hands and a mind that stayed curious even when results looked messy. At the Royal Institution, he worked around Humphrey Davy, first as an assistant and then as a researcher in his own right. He learned chemistry by doing it. He repeated demonstrations until they behaved. Then he pushed them a little further, not with luck, but with control. He improved the apparatus, reduced errors, and turned dramatic tricks into reliable experiments. Faraday also had a gift for explanation. In public lectures, he could make an invisible force feel almost visible, like a pressure you could sense in the room. And he wrote obsessively. He kept detailed notebooks where he recorded what happened, what he expected, and what surprised him. That habit matters because induction is easy to miss. A needle twitches on a meter, a spark snaps, and then it is gone. Many people would shrug. Faraday treated every twitch like a clue. Change one thing, measure again, repeat until the effect stops being a rumor and becomes a rule. August 1831, the accidental spark. In August of 1831, Faraday played with a simple setup, a bar magnet and a coil of wire connected to a sensitive meter. When he moved the magnet, the needle jumped. When he stopped, it fell back. Move the magnet the other way, and the needle kicks the other way. The electricity wasn't steady. It appeared only during the change. That one detail turned into a new field. Faraday started varying everything. Stronger magnets, more turns of wire, different shapes of coils, different distances, different speeds. He noticed that a quick change gave a stronger kick, while a slow change gave a weaker one. The effect wasn't magic. It was repeatable. He also built a famous test with an iron ring wrapped with two separate coils. When he switched current on the first coil, the second coil produced a brief current of its own. Switch it off, and the second coil jumped again. To an observer, it could look like energy was arriving from nowhere, because nothing touched the second coil. But something did change. 
The magnetic state of the ring changed, and the field in space changed with it. From these trials came the blueprint of the electric age, generators that turn spinning shafts into power, transformers that raise and lower voltage for long distance lines, motors that reverse the bargain by turning electricity back into motion. Yet even as the inventions piled up, Faraday kept asking one stubborn question. What is actually acting in the space between magnet and wire? Every power plant today repeats this trick at scale. Spin copper through magnetic fields, keep the change steady, and the current keeps flowing. Machines that proved it. Questions that wouldn't leave. Faraday didn't only publish results, he built machines that proved them. He explored electromagnetic rotation and designed early devices where magnets and conductors could produce continuous current. He also studied the strange case of a spinning metal disc in a magnetic field. It made electricity, yet the usual loop picture felt confusing because the disc wasn't a neat coil. This is the kind of setup that later fed the idea of a Faraday paradox, where simple rules seem to clash with what the meter shows. In private notes, Faraday sounded less like a wizard and more like a man wrestling a stubborn puzzle. He discovered self-inductance, where a circuit resists changes in its own current, and mutual induction, where one coil triggers another. He could measure the effects and use them, yet he still felt the deeper cause was slipping through his fingers. And here is the part many free energy stories skip. Induction pushes back. If you move a magnet near a coil connected to a load, the motion gets harder. It can feel like pushing through thick air. That is not imagination. That resistance is the bill being paid. Your hand supplies extra work and that work leaves your muscles and shows up as electrical power in the circuit. The coil is not creating energy. It is converting the energy you put in, guided by the field around it. Lines of force and why they don't give free energy. Faraday's bold leap was to treat space as active. He spoke of lines of force filling the region around a magnet. He pictured a conductor cutting those lines when it moved. This wasn't just poetic language, it was a new way to think that later became the modern idea of a field, something real in space that can store and carry energy. So why doesn't this become endless power? Because induction is a converter, not a creator. When a current is induced, it opposes the very change that produced it. This built-in opposition is nature's break. If the induced current didn't push back, you could cheat the rules and get energy from nowhere. Instead, the system demands payment in work, in stored energy, or in energy delivered from another source. Even the so-called paradox cases don't break conservation. They usually break our shortcuts. In tricky setups, the circuit is bigger than you think, because metal parts move, contacts slide, and measurement wires quietly make extra loops. When you track the full path charges can take, and the forces acting on them, the accounting closes. The surprise remains, but the energy still comes from somewhere definite. Faraday didn't solve every philosophical itch in his lifetime, but he gave us the working truth. Changing magnetic conditions can drive charges to move. That one fact powers the modern world, the unfinished conversation then and now. In his later years, Faraday kept probing with the same careful stubbornness. He studied electromagnetic rotation, diamagnetism, and other effects that hinted the field idea was bigger than anyone first imagined. He knew a discovery can be complete in what it does, yet incomplete in how it feels in the mind. Picture our program cutting to a live video call with two historians of science. Viewers ask how a self-taught bookbinder learned to think like this. They ask if his faith shaped his sense that nature must be ordered. They ask why others did the heavy math after him. And they ask whether Faraday believed he had opened a door beyond classic theory. The historians give a simple answer. Faraday trusted what experiments said, even when words lagged. Then we turn the lens back to you at home. After watching the experiments, do you feel the free energy claim is stronger or weaker? Some people will say the environment must be full of hidden power. Others will say the real wonder is already huge. A small coil lets us turn wind, water, heat, and motion into light on demand. Both sides share one truth. Faraday's work is an invitation to test, 
not just to believe. Ask a question, build a clean setup, and let nature answer. Faraday's real legacy isn't a secret machine, it's a method. He showed that careful experiments can pull order from mystery, even when the explanation feels unfinished. The so-called Faraday paradox is a reminder that nature stays consistent, but our shortcuts can fail. Induction is not energy from nothing. It is energy changing form, guided by fields we can't see but can measure and use. If future research uncovers deeper layers of those fields, it won't come from hype or fear. It will come from patience, clean tests, and honest notes, the same habits Faraday practiced. The quest goes on for everyone.